Biblical principles of effective educational leadership. What in the world? I don't know how it works for people that are visiting here, but if you live here, and I live here, I've been here for a long time, they just give you a topic and say, here's what we'd like to have. And uh, so I've, we've taken this. I see it. I said, praying about it, thinking about it, meditating on it, thinking, what in the world? And uh, I've got lots of lists. I've been in the business a long time. I've got lots of lists, outlines and lists. There's some papers back there if you want to help her find those when she comes in. Uh, I've got lots of books, lots of things. People write a lot of books about leadership. Uh, J. Willard Marriott, I read a book one time, Marriott, the founder of Marriott, Truett Cathy, Chick-fil-A. Uh, on and on the list goes. Lots of coaches. I'm in the athletic business, so I read uh, Shashevsky. Uh, lots of coaches. Tony Dungy's got a great book on leadership. I have a great book, Winston Churchill on leadership. Never met the man personally, but uh, got a book, Winston Churchill on leadership. Got a lot of great things in there. Uh, doesn't claim to be, didn't claim to be a Christian. I hope to find him in heaven someday. I hope he trusted Christ as a Savior somewhere along the way, but never gave clear testimony of that. I've got a great book, uh, Lessons from the Life of Robert E. Lee. I never met Robert E. Lee either. But lessons from the life of Robert E. Lee, leadership lessons on the life of Robert E. Lee. A lot of things, a lot of lists, a lot of ideas, uh, business leaders, all these people have eyes. David Green, the founder of Hobby Lobby, is a Christian, an outspoken Christian. Got a great book on leadership and leadership principles and uh, lots of things. So I'm pouring, pouring over these things and I'm thinking, I'm praying and uh, thinking about leadership. And I'm thinking, you know, giving a lecture on leadership to me is a little like giving a le lecture on humility. <laughs> you know, who's arrived? I heard a guy say one time about humility. He says he wrote a book, The World's Ten Most Humble People and How I Influence the Other Nine. <laughs> that's, what you, that's what you think a little bit about when you think about, think about leadership. So I was thinking about all these books, thinking about all these authors, thinking about what they all said. A lot of common things. Some things different. But I started thinking about leaders in the Bible. Took a little informal survey, and about everybody thinks Moses is the greatest leader in the Bible. Uh, you may have an opinion. I'm sure you do have an opinion one way or the other. Moses was a great leader. A lot of great leaders in God's Word. And I was asking myself, I thought, if, if these men wrote a book on leadership, what would they tell us? What would they tell us? Well, actually, they did. Or the Holy Spirit did. Gave us a book. And so I want to take for just a moment, before we get to a list of a few what you might call practical things or whatever that means, uh, I've, I've got a list here. Not, not all inclusive by any stretch of the imagination, but if you want to start about leadership and leading people, leading a family, leading your church, leading a school. I'm an educator. I've been a, a teacher for 27 years and uh, been in administration all that business but leading leading whatever a business a family whatever the case is what does God's word have to say about it? and I think God's word gives us some definitive things I was encouraged just looking through this and and thinking and praying and meditating on these let's start with Noah would you say Noah was a great leader Noah was called upon to do a task he was called upon to do something that nobody could even fathom they'd never even seen rain He's building a boat. For what? That's what he was called upon to do. Now, some people may say, well, I don't know how successful Noah was, but he did save his family. Good for him. That's what God, that's what God gave him to do, and he fulfilled that entirely. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, the Bible says, Thus did Noah. What would Noah say if he was going to write a book on leadership? Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. I think Noah would say to us, be completely obedient to God. Be completely obedient to God. Don't have to have all the answers. Don't have to know what all, Don't even know all the questions. Be completely obedient to God. Let's move on. What about Abraham? His name was Abram when we first meet him in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, God says to Abraham, I want you to leave your country and go. And Genesis 12, 4 says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. I think Abraham, if he was going to write a book on leadership for us, would say, take one step at a time. The final destination is usually not obvious. We don't know the end. 
Take one step at a time. God said, go, leave your country. Abram said, let's pack up and go. And he took off. Following on down through Abram's life, we find him in Genesis 22. Happens to be my favorite story in the Bible. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Or a preacher mentioned it last night. He had finally gotten the son that God had promised. And God said to him, go sacrifice him. Kill him. Take him up on the mount. Sacrifice him. He bundled it all up, got the wood, got everything ready. They went on the journey. And uh, Isaac asked him, I see everything here except the sacrifice. And Abraham said, which I, the most powerful phrase in Scripture in my heart and mind, God will provide himself. God will provide himself. But the first three words of that, God will provide. God will provide. You heard the pastor mention this morning, Dr. Robertson, have great faith in God. I think that's what Abraham would tell us. You want to lead? Have great faith in God. What about Joseph? Heard a powerful message last evening on the life of Joseph. Now, therefore, be not grieved. And, of course, chapter 50 and verse 20 might be the capstone verse, God meant it unto good. But I find in chapter 45 of Genesis and verse 5, Now, therefore, be not grieved, Joseph says to his brothers as, they, as he reveals himself to them, nor angry with yourselves, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. If Joseph were going to write a book on leadership, and I'd certainly say, humanly speaking, he was qualified, I think he would say to us, understand that God always knows best, and he is working to fulfill his plan. He always knows best, and he is working to fulfill his plan. What would Joseph say if he was going to write a book on leadership? What about Moses? Arguably, as we said, the greatest leader in the Bible. Be, it'll be uh, great to get to heaven and talk to these people and uh, meet Moses. The Lord said to him in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. I think Moses would say to us, if he was talking to us about leadership, he'd say, Allow, allow God to use what he has given you. Allow God to use what he was, has given you. Do you ever wish you had more? <laughs> more of anything. Yeah, I can think of a lot of things I wish I had more of. Wish I had more time. Wish I had more talent. I wish I had more. I, I sit and listen to these. I sit this week and listen to these men preach. And I know it's supernatural. I know God touches them. God fills them. And from a purely human standpoint, though, I think, man, I wish I could speak like that. What could God do with me if I could? No, hold it, hold it, hold it. God can do with me whatever I allow him to do with me. If I allow him to use whatever tools he's put in my hand. Our pastor says, if you don't have a dog, hunt with a cat. <laughs> you ever hunted with a cat? <laughs> yeah, sure. You use whatever tools God has put in your hand. He said to Moses, he, God calls Moses going to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. That's a big job. I mean, he's looking for charter buses and lots of other things. God says, Moses said, how am I going to do this? God says, what do you have in your hand? He said, a rod. A rod. And what did God do with that? He used it. He used it. What else about Moses? He says, and the Lord said unto him in Exodus chapter 4, 11, verse 11 and 12, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Exodus chapter 4. I think if Moses were talking to us today about leadership, he would say, depend wholly on the Lord. Depend wholly on the Lord. Paul said it this way, in him we live and move and have our being. Depend wholly on the Lord. You know, that's the difference between secular education and Christian education. In a nutshell, that's the difference. Who are we trusting in? Secular education is all about what man can do. It's all about you can empower yourself, we can empower you, we can give you the tools, we can help you. Man can do all this. Christian education is all about what man can't do. And it's all about what God can do. I think that's what Moses would say to us. Depend wholly on the Lord. If Moses were speaking to us today about leadership. What else do I think Moses would say? Moses had a lot to say, I think, about it. He said, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? I love this verse, Exodus 14, verse 15. They've gotten to the Red Sea. Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. 
I think Moses would say to us today, don't complain, not even to God. You can cast your care upon him, for he careth for you. But God says, God said to Moses, wherefore Christ thou unto me? Moses would say, don't complain, determined to go forward for God's glory. We took the time to look at Exodus chapter 14. Uh, uh, repeatedly in there, God talks about him receiving the honor as they go into the Red Sea, the seas are parted, they cross on dry land. Moses would say, don't complain, determined to go forward for God's glory. What about Joshua? He had a tough job. He followed on the hills of Moses. That's tough business. God said to him in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Joshua, I think, would tell us today, draw strength and courage from others who have trusted God for great things. Draw strength and courage from others who have trusted God for great things. That's why you should read lots of great biographies. It'll encourage you. You can draw strength and courage from that. Our courage wanes sometimes. Our strength fails. And, but God has given us a heritage of people that have served the Lord and followed the Lord. And I think Joshua looked to that often. And as he was leading the people uh, across into the promised land, God gave him that promise. And I think Joshua would say to us, as we find in 24, 15, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua would say, be an example. You want to be a leader? Be an example. I often think about how easy it is, how easy it is to expect a higher level of commitment from others. Even the people that you're working with. I've thought often about the students that I have, how, how high, how, what level of commitment I expect from them that I'm not so sure I'm willing to give myself. It's easy to talk about it. Joshua says, look, we're calling on you to, to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He'd say to you, be, it, be an example. What about Gideon? I love the story of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. Judges chapter 7, verse 21. I think Gideon would say to you, and he, would, he would say it softly, by the way. And he wouldn't, be, he wouldn't be anxious to jump up and talk about it. He was trying to hide. God appointed him. And I think he would say to you, if he was talking to you about leadership today, he would say, value the contribution of others. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. There's only 300 of them. Every man in his place. I don't really have time to tell you the story, but let's take it anyway just for a second. The story goes there was a Navy pilot shot down in Vietnam. Spent six years at POW. Plum was his name. P-L-U-M-B. And he recounts the story of he was in a restaurant one day, and a man walked by him, stopped, and said, I know you. You were a fighter pilot in Vietnam. You flew off the aircraft carrier, Kitty Hawk. Plum says, that's exactly right. The man says, you were shot down. You were POW. Plum says, that's right. How would you know that? The man said, I packed your parachute. I packed your parachute. He said, it must have worked. Plum said, it did. And they had a little brief conversation there. And then Plum, he tells, tells the story. He says, he left the restaurant. I got home that night. And he says, he thought, he thought about that man. He said, I wonder how many times I passed that man on that aircraft carrier and never even spoke to him. Because he says, this is Plum's where He says, see, I was a pilot. He was just a sailor. And he said, all those hours he spent down in the bowels of that ship, folding those those, uh, that nylon, folding those, pilot, folding those parachutes every time for a man he didn't even know, probably would never see. In this case, he happened to run into him. And then he, he says, he says, he finished all this, he says, who's packing your parachute? And if you're going to lead something, you're going to lead a home, you're going to lead a business, you're going to lead a church, you're going to lead a class, then you have to know if every person is not standing in their place, then it's not going to function like it has to be. And Plum says, who's packing your parachute? I think Gideon would say, value the contribution of others. What about David? Oh, David could write uh, 1,100 times he's mentioned in Scripture, almost once per chapter, average. 900 and something verses have his name in it. I think he'd say, as he said in Psalm 139, as he prayed, search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. I think he would say, keep your heart in tune with God. Keep your heart in tune with God. David knew something about heartache. David knew something about being the man on the outside only and letting your inner man die. He knew something about that. 
And then God says he's a man after my own heart. God, and he said, search my heart. He would say, keep your heart in tune with God. What about Nehemiah? I love the story of Nehemiah. Maybe my favorite book in the Bible, Nehemiah, one of them. He says, and I sent messengers to them, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah. Uh, tried to discourage him all along. And now the wall's finished. It's almost completed. The only thing that's missing is the doors, the gates hanging on it. That's all that's missing. And they're still after him. They say, come on, let's have a conference. Let's talk about this. And he says, he sends messengers saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? I think Nehemiah, if he's going to give us anything about leadership, say, do not be distracted from the work God has given you to do. There's always detractors, always distractions. Don't be distracted from the work God's given you to do. What about Peter, the New Testament? Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Is that a powerful statement? Ye shall never fall. What things? Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. We could talk about that for a long time. I think Peter would say, diligently strive to realize or to develop all that the Lord has for you. Ye shall never fall. What about Paul? Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I press toward the mark for the prize of the calling of the high God, for the prize of the calling of God, high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Don't lose sight of eternity. Paul would say, Don't lose sight of eternity. One thing. Forgetting all those things. And he had lots of things to forget. Lots of good things and lots of tough things. Don't lose sight of eternity. Here are a few things quickly. I think this is what these men would say to us from God's word. They'd say if they were writing on leadership as the Holy Spirit uh, gave them these things in God's word. And here's some biblical principles for you. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 through 28, you find the story. Dr. Ray spoke about this on, uh, was it Tuesday at lunch? And, uh, and he was talking about... Uh, James and John, their mother, comes and says, who's going to be the greatest? I want my sons, one, to sit on either side. That's where you find in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26 through 28. I'll not recount that story for you right here. But uh, the premise here is biblical leadership is submissive leadership. Submissive leadership. That's what Christ teaches us. Pastor mentioned a book this week, Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery. And he says, Washington says in that book, the happiest individuals are those who do the most to make others useful and happy. Submissive leadership. I was on the way home late last evening, turned on the radio and uh, BBN, and it was was, uh, the reading the book that they do on there twice a day. And it was the story of Nate Saint again. I didn't stay and listen to all of it, but it was early on to talk about when he first got the airplane and was flying in. And I know the story of Nate Saint, and most of you do too, and that's a powerful, powerful story. But what I was thinking about last night are those missionaries that he was flying supplies to. Not one of them I can give you the name of. Now, I can give you Nate Saint's name. He's, he's what we'd call famous in this circle. But those missionaries that had given their life, not one of, I can't tell you the name of one of them on any of those islands. And they'd given their life. And talking about how how the airplane improved their their standard of living and the health and everything. All about. But when they've gone to those islands to be a missionary, they had given it all. That was it. I mean, it wasn't just get on a plane and go home. It wasn't jump on the computer and Skype your friends and family. I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying that's what these people have done. They realized something about greatness, as Dr. Ray was talking about, and leadership. Submissive to God, submissive to God, and submissive to one another. More concerned with the needs of others than your own needs. And that's what those missionaries were. More concerned with the needs of others than with their own own needs. A man, one man has said, if you're talking about education or talking about school, which we're talking about right here, he says, you start at the top with people who are willing to serve at the bottom. Whatever that means, we have our own ideas about what's top and bottom. God has a completely different economy. He has a completely different scale. But in human eyes, the man says, start at the top with people who are willing to serve at the bottom. This represents a person's attitude toward God and toward His Word. As, God, as Christ says, first shall be last and last shall be first. Shall be first. And then our pastor often gives us these four things. Enlist, number one, enlist. Effective leadership, enlist. It's all about people. Education is about influence. 
Education is about influence. The most important decision is the people that are involved or the people you hire. It's a long paragraph right here. This came from Bush Aglow. D.L. Moody wrote this, and it's written in allegorical, allegorical sense, uh, allegorical style, like Pilgrim's Progress or whatever. And uh, just jump right down to the center of it. You can read it for yourself, the entire thing. But the critical influences that shape the life of Mr. Young student arise far more from the evangelical quality of the teacher's life than from the technical excellence of his pedagogy. Education is about influence. The key, the biblical principle of effective leadership is you have to enlist the right people. Your family, your Sunday school, te your Sunday school uh, pastor, in your Sunday school, your school, whatever the case is. The Lord did open his mind to see that the interpreter's house must be put in charge of Mr. Great Heart rather than Mr. Great Head. Enlist. Enlist the right people. Number two, train. Norman Schwarzkopf is dead now. Uh, commanded the U.S. forces in Desert Storm. And he said, leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character. And this was a lifetime army man. Leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character. And Schwarzkopf said, if you must be without the one... Be without the strategy. That's what training is about. Train up a child. It's character. Training. Biblical leadership. Enlist the right people. Train. Train them with the right emphasis. Number three, equip. A leader sees what lies ahead and helps others to prepare. It's a leader's job to equip people. Learn constructive methods to help others grow. Paul spent three years in the Arabian desert under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit. He was a very educated man, but he had to, God was going to equip him for what he had for him in the future. Enlist, train, equip, and then hold accountable. President Bush said, uh, 43, said, A leader attempts to harness the energies of those for whom he is responsible in order to accomplish a common goal. That's what accountability is about. Harness the energies of those for whom he is responsible in order to accomplish a common goal. A spiritual leader will pray for a teacher daily, each teacher daily. If we're talking in a school setting or if you're leading your family, pray for your family daily, your Sunday school class, church, whatever, you, you fill in the blank. Seek to help and encourage others. That's what a leader does. That's what the pastor was talking about today. It's not about being the boss of anybody. It's serving everybody. Offer solutions instead of criticism. Criticism is easy to offer. A leader has solutions. And then display a sincere interest and concern for those that you have the opportunity to work with. Biblical principles of effective educational leadership. Whew, whatever all that is. What does God's Word have to say about it? Well, God's Word gives us a picture. God's Word gives us a picture. And He's given us these men and their lives and these ladies in their lives uh, to be an example. And may the Lord help us. I have a family. I have a lovely family. I have a lovely wife. been married for 27 years and uh, four children. And I want the Lord to help me to lead them faithfully. I have the opportunity to teach in classrooms. I want the Lord to help me to lead them faithfully. All right, let's pray for one another. Pray for the rest of this day. Lord, thank you again for your goodness. Bless the remainder of this day. Bless the services tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you and have a great day.